Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. In 64 AD, the Roman Emperor Nero was in the city of Naples, Italy, performing for the first time in a public theater. Nero was a huge fan of the arts, and he was, reportedly, a very good musician. Just two years earlier, the area had suffered a major earthquake. So when the ground in the theater began to tremble, anxiety ran high. But Nero continued his song, taking his time to get to the last note. After he finished, the crowd raced out and made it just in time to watch the theater crumble and fall. But this was just a precursor, or should I say warning, of the cataclysmic event that was to occur 15 years later. The city of Pompeii, just 17 miles southeast of Naples, stood in the shadow of a great mountain. At least, they thought it was a mountain at that time, but it was actually what we now know as the volcano Mount Vesuvius. That volcano erupted in 79 AD, destroying almost everything in its path, including the beautiful city of Pompeii. When a volcano explodes, the magma, or molten rock, which has been building under the surface, begins to rise. It is more buoyant than the surrounding earth and rock. The pressure slowly builds until the earth's surface is forced to crack open to vent the magma, which then turns to lava. This rather simplified explanation is analogous to the circumstances that created the deadly crimes committed by this episode's killer, Jennifer Pan. For years, the weight of her parents' expectations pushed down on Jennifer, creating a boiling rage that continued to build until the pressure exploded into violence and death. As a Killer Psyche listener, you'll love Audible's new pulse-pounding collection of exclusive thrillers that are guaranteed to keep you on the edge of your seat. With captivating sound design, eerie soundscapes, and dynamic performances, their titles are brought to life. I recommend The Killer Across the Table by John Douglas, my mentor at the FBI Behavioral Science Unit, and his co-author, Mark Olshacker. It is great. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. That's audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. Killer Psyche is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews or news, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call them on your auto insurance, too, with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the third season of Killer Psyche.
I was a psychiatric nurse and then an FBI criminal profiler. In the five decades I've spent studying people's minds, I've interviewed countless murderers, including many serial killers. Why did they do it? To get a satisfying answer, we have to dive deep into their psyche to figure out what made them do what they did. This episode is Jennifer Pan. A little after 10 p.m. on November 8, 2010, three men burst into the Markham, Ontario home of the Pan family. Two of the men grabbed the adult male, Han, and his wife, Bic Ha, and held them at gunpoint downstairs. The other demanded that their daughter, Jennifer, show him where the money was hidden in the house. After leading her upstairs and stealing more than $3,000, the man tied her to the banister upstairs and left her there. When Han told them that he only had $60 in his wallet, one of the intruders pistol whipped him. The three men dragged Han and Bick to the basement where they covered the couple's heads with blankets and shot them. Han was hit in the face and shoulder, and Bick was shot three times in the head. She died instantly. The men then fled the house on foot, seemingly forgetting all about Jennifer tied to the balcony steps. After hearing the gunshots, Jennifer somehow broke free of her bindings and called 911. Verging on hysteria, Jennifer told the dispatcher that three men had broken into her family's house and stolen their money. Jennifer then said that she heard gunshots and that her parents were dead. But at that moment, a male voice was heard in the background. Her father, Han, had miraculously survived and crawled up the steps from the basement. While Han was taken to the hospital and put into a medically induced coma, Jennifer went to the police station for an interview. The police were very patient with Jennifer as she led them through the night's events. The young woman had been through a very traumatic incident that night and lost one of her parents, with the other's life hanging on by a thread. But the following day, some of Jennifer's details did not add up to the detectives. The biggest being, if her hands were tied behind her back and to the banister as she claimed, how did she manage to call 911? They called Jennifer back in to ask her just that. But her explanations did nothing to quell the suspicions the police were beginning to have that Jennifer was not just an innocent victim. And their suspicions were correct. When Han woke up from his coma three days later, the entire narrative of that night changed. Unfortunately for Jennifer, her father remembered everything. Han told police that Jennifer was never tied up, and even more damning, that his daughter spoke with one of the intruders, quote, like a friend. With this new information, the police called her back to the police station for a third interview. The detectives revealed that they knew she had a role in the home invasion. Jennifer confirmed this, but said that the victim was supposed to be her as a type of suicide by proxy. But then, she told detectives, she changed her mind and told the men who she admitted hiring, that she did not want to die anymore. According to Jennifer, the man misunderstood her and took that to mean she wanted her parents dead instead of her. And because of this misunderstanding, they went through with the plot and shot her parents. Wow, that's a whole lot of misunderstanding going on. Needless to say, Jennifer was arrested immediately after the interview 
and charged with first-degree murder and attempted murder. But this was just, as the saying goes, the tip of the iceberg. As the detectives began to unravel the events that led up to the murder, they discovered that Jennifer had not only been lying to them, she had been lying to everyone about everything. So why would Jennifer want her parents dead? Well, it turns out that there were many reasons, but chief among them was her relationship with Daniel Wong. Her parents did not approve of Daniel, uh, with good reason. While still in high school with Jennifer, he was charged with drug trafficking, but they did not know that. In fact, her parents did not know that Jennifer was dating anyone, especially since Jennifer had been forbidden to date anyone at all in high school. She was also not allowed to do anything social, no parties, no dances, or any social gatherings. Her parents had immigrated from Vietnam and every expectation was held that Jennifer and her brother be straight A students and superior in every way. Which was why Jennifer did not tell them that she failed her calculus class and did not graduate high school, which caused the college she was to attend to rescind her acceptance. Not only did Jennifer not tell them, she pretended she got a scholarship and even forged the paperwork for financial aid. Every day for two years, Jennifer would take the bus to the library downtown and copy notes from science websites she found online. She also took the time to visit Daniel at his university and worked a few days a week teaching piano and working as a server at a pizza place. Jennifer then told her father that she was accepted to the University of Toronto's pharmacology program. Her father was so proud of her, he allowed her to sleep at her friend's house during the week to help alleviate the stress of commuting. Instead, and I'm guessing you know what I'm going to say, Jennifer stayed with Daniel and his parents. Her parents began to notice that there were inconsistencies and odd behaviors with their daughter that did not add up. For example, she told them that there would not be enough seats for them to attend the graduation. And when Jennifer told them that she was volunteering at a blood lab, her parents were puzzled that she had no uniform or badge like the other volunteers. Her parents insisted on dropping Jennifer at the lab the next morning. When she left the car, her mother followed her inside. But Jennifer ran inside and hid in the waiting room for hours until she was sure her parents had left. When she did not come home, her parents called the friends she was supposedly staying with and their suspicions were confirmed. Jennifer was not there. Their perfect daughter had lied to them. When Jennifer finally came home, her parents confronted her. She came clean and told them the truth about everything. Well, almost everything. Jennifer confessed that she was not a volunteer at the lab and was never a pharmacology student at the University of Toronto. She also told them that she was spending the night with Daniel and his family. However, Jennifer did not tell them that she never graduated high school or attended college. That information she held back. Her parents were furious, and rightly so. Her father wanted to kick her out of the house, but her mother convinced him to let her stay. Her father relented, but only if Jennifer followed a very strict set of rules and we'll get to those later. But for Jennifer, the worst restriction was that she cut off all contact with Daniel for good. 
Of course, that did not happen. And after sneaking around with him for a bit, Daniel grew tired of having to lie and broke up with her. That was the last straw for Jennifer, who at 24 years old had now lost all of her freedoms and her love. This was the catalyst for the first time Jennifer tried to hire someone to kill her parents. But the elementary school friend she hired ghosted her after taking her money. Furious that she had been swindled and desperate to get rid of her overbearing parents, she reached out to Daniel. He knew a guy who could help her if she paid $10,000. But money was not an issue for Jennifer. If the hit was successful, she'd inherit her parents' estate, about $500,000. And not only that, she and Daniel could rekindle their relationship and finally be together in peace. So together, they hatched the home invasion plan. And although Daniel did not want to be a part of the actual murder, he connected Jennifer to the three hitmen. The police learned that it was Jennifer who left the door open and Jennifer that signaled the men to come in. And within a few months, after an extensive search through her phone records, all four of her helpers, the three men and Daniel, were also put in handcuffs. All of Jennifer's lies and deceptions were about to come to light. And I can tell you, that is not a good look for a jury. Killer Psyche is sponsored by BetterHelp. With social gatherings picking up for spring, it can be easy to ignore your social battery and spread yourself too thin. Whether you thrive around people or you prefer some more alone time, therapy can give you the self-awareness to build a social life that does not drain your battery. Your therapist can help you identify triggers and appropriate coping mechanisms so you can continue to build helpful habits. Plus, therapy can be beneficial for everyone, not just for those who've experienced major trauma. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, so it's convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Find your social sweet spot with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com Psyche today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Psyche. Okay, it's time to commit. 2024 is the year for prioritizing yourself. Begin your new smile journey with Byte, and you could start seeing results in just two to three weeks. Just order your at-home impression kit today for only $14.95 at Byte.com. Bite Clear Aligners are doctor-directed and delivered to your door. Treatment costs thousands less than braces. Plus, they offer financing options, accept eligible insurance, and you can pay with your HSA, FSA. Get 80% off your impression kit when you use code WONDERY at Bite.com. That's B-Y-T-E dot com. Start your confidence journey today with Bite. Jennifer Pan was born on June 17, 1986, in Scarborough, Canada, just a few miles northeast of Toronto. Her father, Han Pan, was a political refugee from Vietnam who fled to Canada in 1979. Not long after settling into the country, he fell in love with Jennifer's mother, Vic Ha. The couple had their second child, Jennifer's brother, three years after she was born. Han and Bick made a living by working at a local auto parts manufacturing company. They saved every penny they could. And as their kids got older, they made it their mission to set them up for success. When Jennifer was only four years old, Han and Bick enrolled her in piano lessons. When she started elementary school, they put her in figure skating. By the time Jennifer was 10, 
she already had an intense daily routine. According to an article in Toronto Life magazine written by a former classmate, Jennifer would, quote, come home from skating practice at 10 p.m., do homework until midnight, and head to bed. On top of piano and figure skating, her parents enrolled her in martial arts and swim lessons. Between the extracurriculars and keeping her grades up, Jennifer felt trapped in an endless cycle of work. The pressure on Jennifer to succeed only got worse when she got to secondary school. Even though she was, quote, a social butterfly who got along with just about everyone, she never had time to foster real friendships with her peers, and her parents did not encourage her to do so. In fact, they forbid her from going to school dances and sleepovers, and she was not allowed to date until college. One former classmate later said her parents were, quote, absolutely controlling, and that, quote, they treated her like shit for such a long time. Jennifer began to take frustration and anger out on herself by cutting her skin. Cutting, or non-suicidal self-injury, also known as NSSI, occurs when a person harms their own body on purpose to deal with emotional pain stress, anger, sadness, without the intention of suicide. According to the American Psychological Association, quote, people who self-harm may carve or cut their skin, burn themselves, bang or punch objects or themselves, embed objects under their skin, or engage in a myriad of other behaviors that are intended to cause themselves pain but not end their lives. A 2013 article published in the Journal of Child and Family Studies cites research that found, quote, youth who self-injure report less emotional support, more criticism, and excess behavioral control from family members. This could certainly describe Jennifer Pan and her relationship with her parents. This condition was classified in the DSM-5 as a symptom of borderline personality disorder. For those of you new to killer psyche, BPD is a personality disorder that hampers a person's ability to regulate their emotions. People with this diagnosis often lack impulse control, have extreme mood swings, and tend to see the world in black and white. In ninth grade, Jennifer's grades started to fall. She did well in her music classes, but in other subjects, she had a C average, a grade that was simply not allowed in her household. Out of desperation, Jennifer learned how to forge report cards. From that point on, she used those reports to trick her parents into believing that she was a straight A student. It might actually be easier to turn a C into a B, but Jennifer went straight to the top. She had to be perfect. In 11th grade, Jennifer met Daniel Wong and began to secretly date him. As I mentioned before, dating was among her parents' forbidden activities. And as we all know, the best way to get a teenager to be non-compliant is to forbid them to do something. After the murder, quite a bit was made of Jennifer's parents being tiger parents. News stations, magazines, and newspapers painted a picture of a woman pushed to the edge by her tiger parents. The term tiger mom entered the zeitgeist when a Yale Law School professor, Amy Chua, wrote a memoir about raising her children in what she termed Confucian style, which to her meant a strict, traditional Chinese approach. While tiger parenting has been linked to the Asian community, it is not limited to one ethnicity. There are forms of tiger parents in every culture, and those can also cause stress and trauma to their children. 
Jennifer Lee, a sociology professor at UC Irvine, says, quote, the danger of highlighting cases like Jennifer's is that they contribute to a misconception that all Asian American kids experience this extreme pressure and are mentally unstable. And the term tiger parent is ascribed to any parent, regardless of ethnicity or culture, who pushes their children to succeed in academics and extracurriculars by using psychological controls and punishments, something that absolutely describes Han and Bic. Jennifer's parents were consumed with their daughter being successful, their version of successful, and attempted to control every facet of her life well into her 20s. This is very similar to the term authoritative parenting. Authoritative parenting, according to a 2023 article by psychologist Emily Garnada, is a parenting style that features, quote, high demands, low levels of warmth, and strict discipline. Authoritarian parents offer little room for negotiation or explanation for punishments. Over time, this parenting style can result in long-lasting mental health challenges for children. Yale sociology professor Lee also said, quote, Jennifer's parents certainly had a role in making her feel trapped, but I think there's a broader discussion to be had about the expectations that teachers, peers, and institutions place on people like Jennifer to fit that stereotype of the exceptional Asian American student. Now, were Jennifer's parents strict? Were they tiger parents or authoritarian parents? Yes. Was that damaging enough to be an excuse to murder? Absolutely. 100% not. When Jennifer failed her calculus test and did not graduate, the fear she had in disappointing her family, or more likely the repercussions of it, played a large role in her future deceptions. Once Jennifer started lying, it seemed as though she lost herself in the lie. Jennifer later stated, quote, I tried looking at myself in the third person and I didn't like who I saw, but rationalizations in my head said I had to keep going. Otherwise, I would lose everything that ever meant anything to me. Was Jennifer a pathological liar? No, because a pathological liar sometimes lies with no clear motive or for the attention. Jennifer was lying because she was trying to lead a double life. Does that mean she was delusional? Absolutely not. A delusion is a belief that someone will hold even when presented with evidence to the contrary. A lie is an untrue statement that is intended to deceive. And Jennifer knew what she was telling her parents was not true but she was so entrenched in her lies that she would follow through with the actions of getting on a bus to go to a school she did not attend and forging transcripts and other documents. Again, that is not a delusional person. It is a person that is so scared to tell the truth that she doubles down on her lies. And that happens when you lead a double life like Jennifer did. According to an article published in Psych Varsity in June of 2023, individuals who do that adopt this duality to fulfill various psychological needs. These needs might include a yearning for escapism, a thrill for deception, or even an outlet for unfulfilled desires. So why did Jennifer do it? Did Jennifer plan initially to begin a double life? It seems that she did, but I also think things got out of hand for her. I think it all started because she was simply afraid of her parents, especially her father. When it was time for Jennifer to graduate from University of Toronto, 
Her parents were ecstatic and could not wait to see their daughter walk across the stage and get her degree. For that, Jennifer had yet another lie in store for them. She claimed that her graduating class was too large and she would only receive one graduation ticket. She told them she didn't want either parent to feel left out, so she decided to give the ticket to a friend. Jennifer could have ended her years of deception then and there. Up to that point, Han and Bick believed everything she told them, even the ridiculous graduation ticket story. Lying initially about not being able to graduate high school was easy to understand, but the profound deception that followed, and for many, many years, is far more complex. The psychology behind living a double life is fraught with potential pitfalls, as you can imagine. Jennifer had to be lying constantly, as well as fabricating evidence to support her lies. Can you imagine the stress that created? Living a double life carries significant psychological perils. The constant juggling act, maintaining lies, and the fear of exposure can trigger anxiety and guilt. For a regular person, it would be intense, even unbearable. But for a narcissist or someone with psychopathic tendencies, it would be easier. According to the Psych Varsity article, one of the many reasons people may start living a double life can be as simple as the thrill of deception. The risk and danger associated with maintaining a secret life can be exhilarating for some individuals, leading them to seek an adrenaline rush that drives their duplicity. And when you think about it, why would anyone put themselves through the stress of leading a double life unless it was in some way rewarding? What do I always say about rewarded behavior? It becomes reinforced when it gets you what you want. Up until that point, Jennifer's lies always helped her to have her cake and eat it too. Jennifer certainly is not the only person to ever lead a double life, but she is not as well known as some famous people who led dual lives, such as world-class cyclist Lance Armstrong. He was publicly known as a dedicated athlete and cancer survivor, but privately, he led a double life involving performance-enhancing drugs, something that he denied for years. Even on national TV, in an interview with Oprah Winfrey, watched by over four million people, he claimed he was not doping. He also lied about making a $250,000 donation to the United States Anti-Doping Agency. It was one lie after another, even in the face of overwhelming proof. He'd have been better off not giving the interview, but obviously he thought he could convince Oprah and the world that the facts were not what they seemed. In a way, Jennifer did the same thing as Armstrong. She continued to lie to her parents about not being with her boyfriend. Nothing changed for the better. Her family situation only got worse. Jennifer thought the only way out was murder, even though, as I've said before, and will most likely say again, she could have left at any time time. The consequences of a revealed double life can be devastating, and in her case, it was. The damage to relationships, reputation, and trust is often irreversible, and that alone could have caused significant psychological distress to both Jennifer and her parents. Clearly, they all would have been better off had she left her parents' home and forged a life for herself. But they did not want to let go of her. And Jennifer did not want to stand on her own two feet. 
But liars eventually get caught. And it was her final lie, the phony volunteer job that unraveled it all. Once Han and Bick found out about the lies, they put their foot down and pressed an even stricter set of guidelines for her. Their rules were difficult for Jennifer, and she posted on social media when she was able to sneak her phone that, quote, living in her house was like living under house arrest. Keep in mind, Jennifer was 24 years old and still being punished by her parents. Her parents were not the only ones that she lied to. When Daniel broke up with Jennifer, he began dating another woman. Jennifer could not stand it. So what did she do? Per usual, she lied. She told Daniel that a group of men came to her home pretending to be police officers, rushed inside, and gang-raped her. Adding to her lie, she said that she found a bullet in an envelope in her mailbox. And here's the kicker. She also told Daniel that his new girlfriend was behind the incidents. Was there any proof to those events or allegations? Of course not. Jennifer's decision to kill her parents stemmed from the idea that it would be easier to kill them than move out on her own and be independent. She was, in a way, taking the easy way out. Jennifer was naive enough and narcissistic enough to think that she could get away with murder how she always did, by lying. But eventually, like most narcissists, Jennifer got sloppy. She did not forge documents or think through her lies. And although the police are generally pretty good lie detectors, Jennifer had made it very easy for them. If I asked you how many subscriptions you have, would you be able to list all of them and how much you're paying? If you would have asked me this question before I started using Rocket Money, I would have said yes. But let me tell you, I would have been so wrong. I can't believe how many I had and all the money I was wasting. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. That's rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. Rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. After a lengthy investigation, Jennifer and her accomplices stood trial together on March 19, 2014. One of the hired hitmen was removed from the trial soon after it started. His lawyer became too ill to go on, and he was tried separately at a later date. As predicted, the Crown's theory of the case painted Jennifer as a lifelong liar, compelled to kill her parents after they found out she had been deceiving them. According to prosecutors, Jennifer wanted two things, Daniel and her parents' money. They argued she had no remorse and that no amount of strict parenting would excuse murder. In their eyes, the blame was 100% on Jennifer. I could not agree more. Why? Jennifer could have left her parents' home any time after she was 18 and forged her own life. But she didn't want to do that. She wanted their money. By the time of the trial, Jennifer's father, Han, had made a full recovery and was one of the first witnesses the prosecution called. Han told the jury that when he found out Jennifer's college career was an elaborate, years-long lie, he and his wife were in disbelief. He said, quote, 
I was very upset because all our effort was to help her attend school, and she was not. I told her to cease the relationship with Danny Wong or wait until I'm dead. And not to be insensitive, but that kind of was what she was trying to do. Han also told the jury the same thing he told police after the incident, that he never saw Jennifer tied up and that she spoke softly with one of the intruders just before the shooting happened, as if she knew him. Having her own father testify against her in court was extremely damaging to Jennifer's defense. Everything he said fit the picture the prosecution painted of Jennifer, that she was a lifelong liar, a manipulator who could not handle the pressure of her deceptions finally catching up to her. Weeks later, it was Jennifer's turn to take the stand. She was the only defendant to do so. In a shocking turn of events, Jennifer finally took some responsibility and admitted to wanting her dad killed. She explained that her first attempt at hiring a hitman turned out to be a scam. That's when she decided to change course and hire a hitman as a form of suicide because she, and I quote, was a failure and had so many lies. Just like she had told police before, she claimed that she ultimately tried to call off the plan. But this time, she added an extra detail. Allegedly, she paid one of the men $8,500 as a cancellation fee. I find that rather humorous. Well, let me get this straight. There's a small cancellation fee in some restaurants if you don't show up for a reservation. There can be a cancellation fee, minimal one, on this, that, and the other. But on a hit to kill your parents? Oh, come on, Jennifer. And it's interesting, she never mentioned that to the police before. Clearly, she's sitting around in her jail cell thinking up various things that might work for her. She's a desperate woman. When questioned about why she constantly lied about the murder and her education, she said it was to protect herself from her parents. She also said their strict parenting made her depressed, anxious, and suicidal throughout her life. That may be true, but she still could have left. In fact, she did leave pretty much every day to go somewhere else and pretend to be in school. So she was not without agency. Her argument was clear. Her parents and her co-conspirators were to blame, not her. But for the Crown, it would not be that hard to prove the opposite. The jury was shown mounds of evidence. Texts between Jennifer Daniel and their accomplices revealed the months of planning that led up to that fatal night in November 2010. But the text also showed that most of Jennifer's testimony was, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ah, a lie. In the messages, Jennifer never directed the hit on herself, meaning there was never any mention of suicide nor was there any cancellation of any kind. The exchanges show careful planning, with Jennifer even offering a time to meet with the hitmen days before the attack. The jury also watched portions of Jennifer's police interview videos. They were able to see how her story changed in the final interview, but that's not all they saw. They heard Jennifer herself explain just how far back her lies went, starting when she was a teenager. The court justice told the jury to keep in mind that lying does not automatically make someone guilty of a crime, but that would not be easy for them to separate. In his closing arguments, Jennifer's defense attorney said that she, quote, would never be part of any plan to hurt her mother and she wasn't a part of a plan to hurt her father. But 
unfortunately for Jennifer, the jury was not convinced. Jennifer and her accomplices were all found guilty of first-degree murder and attempted murder. In January of 2015, they were sentenced to two life sentences each with the possibility of parole after 25 years. When handing down the sentences, the Crown Justice said this about Jennifer. Quote, she lived a life of deception. This was a business transaction. The commodity, death. The remaining member of the group pled guilty for his role in the crime months later. He had 18 years added to an existing life sentence for a separate murder he committed years before. He died in prison four years later. Jennifer's father and brother were granted a restraining order against Jennifer. And to this day, she is not allowed to contact them. Last May, the Canadian press reported that the Ontario Appellate Court ordered new trials for Jennifer and all three men. The court said that the judge should have given jurors more, quote, possible verdicts like second-degree murder or manslaughter. As a result, their first-degree murder convictions were overturned, but the attempted murder convictions still stand. I don't understand that at all because there was a mountain of planning, evidence of planning, and that means premeditated, and premeditated means first degree. In August, the Crown appealed to Canada's Supreme Court, hoping to reinstate the convictions. Until her new trial begins, Jennifer, now 37 years old, continues to serve her sentence at a women's prison in Kitchener, Ontario. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. From Wondery and Treefort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Ann Liu is our producer, and Jada Williams is our associate producer. Story research and additional writings by Ann Liu, Will Christensen, and Jada Williams. Mix and sound design by Aaron Bauman. Head of audio, Tom Monahan with audio assistance from Masuzu Enaga. For Wondery, Stephanie Wachneen and Claire Chambers are producers, and Callum Plews is senior managing producer. The executive in charge of production for Treefort is Oscar Guido, and the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marsha Louie, Morgan Jones, and Erin O'Flaherty for Wondery. And last but not least, myself, Candace DeLong. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. Whether you're working out, walking, or running errands, Audible can help you keep your heart rate up month after month with their pulse-pounding collection of thrilling audiobooks that you can't hear anywhere else. As an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog, which includes thousands of titles. This month, check out the Audible original, The Space Within. It's a chilling eight-part story about a psychiatrist, Dr. Maddie Weil, voiced by Academy Award winner Jessica Chastain, who is tasked with unlocking the memories of a child who went missing for seven hours. Maddie soon discovers that there are more who have faced similar experiences, and the truth of what is happening to them may impact the fate of of humankind. 
New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash thrill or text thrill to 500-500. That's audible.com slash thrill or text thrill to 500-500.